Dead or alive, you are coming with me. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. Welcome to the Bangers and Macho once more. I am your host, Mr. Bangers, a.k.a. Zach. My usual co-host, JD, a.k.a. Mr. Mash, can't be here tonight because, like all the other Detroit policemen, he's on strike. So instead, I have a special guest host with me tonight. Please introduce yourself, good sir. My name is Brandon Lede, and I write for the film criticism website Swamp Flicks out of New Orleans. That is a quality publication that I endorse. <laughs> and today we are talking about RoboCop, the future of law enforcement. For me, RoboCop is one great movie and then this spin-off franchise of middling to mediocre to outright bad ancillary programs. <laughs> yeah, I think the original is unimpeachable as one of the best sci-fi films ever made. Pretty much the height of Verhoeven's satire. Thing that he echoed very well when he did uh, Starship Troopers. Very slick and commercial on the surface, but there's just something really biting and ugly right underneath that. The sequels, yeah, like you're saying, are not as good, but I've always enjoyed the second one a little bit. It's not something I watch as often as the first, but I think that one holds up okay. Everything else is just this weird spin-off sub-hell of blatantly commercial products that just completely miss the point of the original thing they're echoing, which is kind of fascinating, but not something you can usually get behind on an artistic level. On this show, I am completist, so if I have to talk about one movie, I have to talk about all the movies. <laughs> we get the best of both worlds. The fastest reflexes modern technology has to offer onboard computer-assisted memory and a lifetime of on-the-street law enforcement programming. It is my great pleasure to present to you Robocop. Old Detroit has a cancer. Cancer is crime. Yes. Your move, hey, creep. You're dead. We killed you. Robocop, the future of law enforcement. Let's start with the first one from 1987, the original RoboCop, which was, of course, written by Ed Newmeyer. Do you know who they originally wanted to direct this film? No, I had no idea, honestly. I don't know anything about backstory. Alex Cox. Who is that? Guy who did Repo Man. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would have been great. When they first presented it to Paul Verhoeven, you know, I'm sure people know that he had a lot of success in the Netherlands and was trying to break into the American film industry and did a movie with Rutger Hauer called Flesh and Blood. Have you ever seen that one? No, I haven't seen his early stuff at all. Well, Flesh and Blood is subversive medieval action movie all about how much the Middle Ages sucked. But <laughs> when Verhoeven first read the script for RoboCop, he saw the title and threw it in the trash because he thought it was going to be a kid's movie. And it wasn't until his wife dug the script out of the trash and told him to reconsider. That was the start of not only his American career, but this franchise. This original RoboCop is all in all one of my favorite movies. I really love it. I've always said that it is both a great American 80s action movie and also a perfect satire of 80s American action movies. Interesting that initial reaction that it's for kids and kind of something you can easily dismiss kind of is that as well. It's like both a hard R, uh, ultra violent, dark satire. You could see how he would be magnetized to that as a director. But yeah, it's also slickly commercial for kids at the same time. For years and years, RoboCop, at least from my end of things, was dismissed as just a big dumb action movie which seems insane watching it now because it's not as if the satire is especially subtle <laughs> it's right in there and you have these hilarious fake commercials for the giant car which is the sucks 3000 or whatever <laughs> and the battleship style board game about nuclear war for a long time it seemed like people would just say oh robocop it's just a big dumb shoot 'em up action movie yeah i wonder how much of that is people remembering the echoes of the comic books and the tv show and everything else that spun off from it how much of that muddled its initial 
digital legacy. Reviewers at first latched on to the satire. Like you said, it's pretty much interrupted by these comedy sketches that wink, wink, and nudge, nudge at you. It seems like that faded over time. People forgot that it was actual biting satire. Definitely, Orion wanted this to be just a big special effects action franchise, and that's more or less what it would become over the sequels. Something else that I've read about this movie, it's rather prescient in some ways, isn't it? Oh, the privatization of police and military? That never goes away. It gets worse over time. That and Detroit is still a city in decline over the years. There's actually a really clever shot. It's almost a rape scene when the woman is being attacked in this empty parking lot, and there's this billboard for New Detroit above their heads. That's a very visual way of saying, this is what people want, and this is the reality. Yeah, I feel like maybe gentrification is a little more subtle now. It takes years, whereas in this movie, there's a corporation that just wants to buy the city wholesale, but it's just a slightly more heightened version of the reality we live in, which is always what good satire is. When you're a kid watching this, I saw this movie when I was about 10 years old. You don't really pick up on that stuff as much. Mostly you just see the really cool 80s special effects and the super violent action. Mm -hmm. As far as the design work goes, the great Rob Bottin did a lot of the practical effects for this film. He designed the RoboCop suit, which is one of the most iconic images in 80s cinema, I think. That is a highly marketable image. It's really not a surprise that that has lasted in people's memories. It looks like a new car, kind of like that Sox commercial. looks like something you would want to purchase because it's so sleek. No wonder they would try and sell to kids because you look at RoboCop and you think that would make an awesome toy. Right. And not just the practical effects, but also the stop motion effects from the great Phil Tippett. I don't know about you, but Ed 209 is one of my favorite robots in all of cinema. Yeah, and it's really cool that he lasted longer than just this one movie. He's in all three of them. They bring him back for the two sequels a little bit. To me, Ed looks like the crossbreed between a T-Rex and a pickup truck and a tank. (laughs) The big joke is that it's completely useless, right? This high-tech killing machine, but it can't go downstairs. Right. (laughs) And it's got those dumb lion roars, which are all bark and no bite. It sounds like a scary animal, but it's pretty easily defeated when it comes down to it. Love that there's so much personality in Ed when it falls down the stairs and it starts crying like a baby and shaking its (laughs) hands back and forth. All that stuff is great. The violence. Infamously, this movie got an X rating when it was first admitted to the MPAA. Paul Verhoeven, in his Dutch movies, it's more explicit sex. But when he came to America, he changed that to the far more Americanly acceptable explicit violence. When anytime anybody gets shot in this movie, there's a massive squib. The most infamous moment is when Ed 209 malfunctions and turns the one board director into Swiss cheese. And then his coworker nonchalantly go back to shuffling papers in the background. They ask afterwards <laughs> something like, get a medic, or is he okay, even though the guy has been blown to smithereens. <laughs> I feel like this movie's ethos towards gory 80s action is best summed up in the scene when Emil drives his car into the toxic waste tank and emerges as this mutated, melted, subhuman thing and immediately gets run over by a car and splatters. And that scene has no reason to be in the movie. Uh, It's like an extra wandered off a Cronenberg set aimlessly. It does not fit with the rest of the worldview. This really fucked up special effects sequence seemingly put in for the hell of it. But God bless it, because when you talk about Robocop, that's usually the second or third thing people mention. That's probably the biggest practical effects feat right there is watching him turn into liquid something really gross and definitely memorable and has survived into the modern age as a gif as all (laughs) things must so you're not super familiar with Verhoeven's overall oeuvre no, not really. I mean, his 80s and 90s big pictures, the stuff that you would know, are the ones that I grew up with. But I've never gone back and watched his Dutch films or anything like that. Well, unfortunately, they're getting harder to track down because all those DVDs are out of print and a lot of them haven't been re-released yet. In his Dutch films, Paul Verhoeven is obsessed with Jesus, and he includes casual Christ imagery in all of his films. Apparently, Robocop is himself supposed to be a Christ figure. I mean, it makes sense with the death and resurrection. Didn't really track it out that way, but it would make sense that it'd have the hero's journey narrative structure to it. Yeah, obviously Murphy dies and comes back to life, and the scene where he's blown apart by Clarence Boddicker and his gang is very much like a crucifixion. If you want to look even more into it, at the end when they're in the industrial area and they're fighting Boddicker's gang, there's actually a scene where Robocop is walking on water. Oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. And yeah. afterwards, Boddicker stabs him in the side with a spear. Really want to dig for the Christ imagery in this film, you can find it. They try to do the same thing with his partner Lewis in a later sequel where they get really explicit with it in a church where she's being carried around as this dead body. Like I said, there's a lot of graphics X in Verhoeven's earlier films, and in a lot of his later films, too. There isn't so much here in Robocop, you know, Alex Murphy doesn't get a love scene. 
Except I think he kind of does. After he's been shot by the OCP officers and Anne Lewis has taken him out to this abandoned warehouse district, they're trying to recalibrate his shooting system. He's shooting jars of baby food. I notice that Nancy Allen is caressing his arm in an almost romantic fashion. And after she does that, suddenly he can shoot straight. And then we get that shot of the baby food jar exploding with goo flying everywhere. I feel like that's a subtextual sex scene almost. I never noticed that he's flirting with her by missing on purpose earlier. They're not actually recalibrating anything. Thing. He's purposefully putting his gun off so that she will touch him in that way. I don't know. Maybe I'm just blowing smoke up my own ass there. But no, no, I, no, I totally buy that. It is a very charged scene, which is weird because they don't really have that chemistry or rapport in any other moment of the movie. Around about half of the film, Robocop Murphy is mourning for his wife in his previous life. The scene where he goes to the house that used to be his family house, and it's cutting in between his memories and this automated sale pitch. I talk about crazy action in this and the satire and all that stuff awesome. But what I think really makes this movie genuinely good is it does have an emotional heart to it and you do feel something for Murphy as he's rediscovering his past life and that scene I think is fantastically directed. I think he's playing with humor there as well. Once he gets to the point where he punches out one of the TVs that's advertising the sale of the house, it does get to this kind of humorous melodrama. thought he was about to go do that Kevin Bacon angry warehouse dancing thing from like <laughs> the exact next scene is he, he goes to the punk dance club to get Leland from Twin Peaks kind of did immediately go into a dance scene right after that. That scene is funny to me because it starts with him having that genuine the suppressed memories of his wife bubbling to the surface and you feel bad for him, but it ends on like an oddly humorous note. I always think of Verhoeven as a prankster and you can feel that toying with the audience spirit a little bit where he wants you to feel something genuine in one moment and the next second it's a joke. Yeah, that's a good point. You can never really tell if Verhoeven is being 100% sincere in anything he does. There's always a grin to it. That always messes me up with Dutch movies is they have a a really dark sense of humor. It's sometimes difficult to detect because the subject matter is usually objectively terrible. These really vicious things happen to these characters. There's like an absurdity to the trials that the characters go through that you're supposed to laugh at at some point. And it is very difficult to draw that line. When am I being prompted to giggle? And when am I being prompted to pry my eyes out? That's a good point. After he made Hollow Man, Verhoeven went back to Holland and made a movie called Black Book, where it's a harrowing story of a Jewish woman during World War II's family killed by the Nazis and she goes undercover as a spy. But it's also a rip-roaring pulp adventure in a lot of ways. <laughs> so there's this weird balance between the genuine tragedy and the sly humor of it. But getting back to Robocop, Peter Weller, before this, had done Buckaroo Bonsai. Already had one genuine cult hit. But then with Robocop, I think he submitted his reputation as this beloved cult movie icon. I honestly have not seen him in very many things, except the one Cronenberg movie. Yeah, and, Lunch. Uh, yeah, and Buckaroo Bonsai. I think that's about it. Yeah, well, those are his biggest credits. He did a movie in the 80s called of Unknown Origin, which is... Oh, a, I've seen that one, yeah. The rat movie. Yeah, it's him fighting a rat. It's not a great movie, but that final act where he makes a homemade armor and goes mano a ratto is incredible. <laughs> I really like the inconsistency of the size of the rat in that movie. That's what tickles me most about that one. If I ever run out of other topics to talk about, I'll have to do a killer rat movie episode of the podcast. <laughs> He's genuinely a really good act. Robocop's movement, that very robotic precision movement, was all him. That wasn't anything to do with the suit. His body language created that character. And every Thing is super controlled, and yet you do get this sense of emotion through him, and especially the scene where he goes into the OCP archives and he puts the data probe, which is insane to look at now. Instead of having a USB plug, he has a giant spike that comes out of his fist. <laughs> he pulls up his own profile and sees that he was murdered, and even though Robocop is completely unexpressive, his face doesn't move, somehow you understand what he's feeling at that moment, and I don't know if you can credit that to Weller or Verhoeven or the cinematographer or whoever. I really think that Weller's performance in this film is great. The scenes where the helmet's completely off and you see this bare face, he does this really interesting thing where it's all restraint and you can see him trying to look as hold as possible but at some points it's on purpose. He's trying to hide that he's thinking and feeling. That's not like an easy thing to convey with just simple facial expression. He is acting his ass off in a role where he could probably get by not even trying. And then you consider the fact that he was wearing this hugely heavy, hot, uncomfortable suit the whole time too. Yeah, and I love that final line where the old <laughs> man asks, nice suit and what's your name, son? And he turns to the camera and says, Murphy, which should probably be super cheesy, but <laughs> for some reason, I think the film totally earns it. Oh, it's a very triumphant moment. Feel good for him that he finally has found an identity. It's not just Weller who's great. I think this film has an A supporting cast. I know Dan O'Harely was really good in it. It was interesting to see like, a few actors from Twin Peaks converge here. What's his name? Ray Wise? Mm -hmm. 
Zealand. I can't remember the guy's name. He was like the sarcastic foreigner. Miguel Fierre? Yeah, he was really good. He's Bob Morton in this, and he was Albert Rosenfield on Twin Peaks. Yeah, it was interesting to see all these really intense actors come together before they were on a more melodramatic show that used them for a completely different purpose. Nancy Allen, she's really the reoccurring performer in all of these films. Peter Weller's only in two of them, and she's in all three. I think there's five actors who have been in all of them, but most of them are background characters, like a police chief or... Right, the stereotypical black police chief is in all of them, isn't he? Yeah, and then there's the guy who kind of looks like Colin Powell with the wireframe glasses who works in the boardrooms. He's in all of them. He does look like Colin Powell. He totally does. <laughs> we go to Ann Lewis first because she's RoboCop's sidekick, quasi-love interest. She gets the most to do besides him. Nancy Allen is good in this, though it is sort of interesting to look at subtle sexism of 80s because on one hand, she's a very proactive, strong character. She's a police officer. She's out there. She's kicking ass. She blows up a guy with an anti-tank gun. But at the <laughs> same time, in that first scene, the reason she gets punched out is because she looks at the guy's dick. That part was pretty goofy, but when you first meet her, we do see her beating the shit out of a man, holding her own, and it's very convincing. And um, they do and have those Starship Troopers, like, group showers and co-ed locker rooms where they establish the two genders in the police department as being on an even footing. That theme will continue into Troopers, you're right. The super fascist Federation and Starship Troopers is many, many things, but at least it isn't sexist. <laughs> I wonder if she's ever really been asked to play tough like this in other films, because she does it pretty well. She's a little tough in Dress to Kill. I guess it's undermined by the fact that she plays a hooker. She's a little tough in that. That's true. My absolute favorite supporting character in this film is Clarence Boddicker, played by Kurt Wood Smith, I guess, depending on your generation, is maybe better known as the dad from that 70s show. Oh, yeah, for sure. And he's terrifying in this. He's like a evil James Carville. <laughs> Everything he does has this super dry sense of humor to it. First off, he doesn't look like the traditional 80s action villain. Beerhoven said he cast him because he looks like an accountant. <laughs> I do believe him when he's cruel. It's a very believable kind of cruelty. Literally laughing at other people's misery, and you can see him taking joy in it. Yeah, he's super vicious. He's joking around when he blows off Murphy's hand which is amazingly graphic special effects. If you want to talk about Christ imagery and that killing trial that his body is put through in that execution of... It's very much a crucifixion. Kurtwood Smith has this delivery that makes little, little lines into these things that you quote to your friends forever, like, can you fly, Bobby? And <laughs> guns, 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 when he's in the cocaine factory. Of course, the best one is Bitches Leave. Was that reused in Triple X, or am I remembering things wrong? I've never seen Triple X, so I can't okay. help you there. <laughs> I'm woefully undereducated in the cinema of Vin Diesel in general. Unless you have a particular affinity for new metal, I think you can skip that whole franchise. But <laughs> I do believe that one quote is reused in Triple X by a Russian character. And another thing I love about this film, no, I'm just gushing about this movie, but Basil Paladoris' score. You really miss that in the sequels. They kind of go for a more Indiana Jones action adventure vibe in the sequels, and it just doesn't fit the property as well. They brought Paladoris back for the third one, but Leonard Roseman did the music for part too, and it's nowhere near as good. It's okay, but the score for the first movie is so fucking great. If I'm going totally into hyperbole here, I genuinely think it's one of the greatest movie scores of all time. I love it <laughs> that much. That main melody, that dun 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 do 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 do, it's so immediately iconic. And I love how there's this destroying element, but also this metallic element, which speaks to the theme in the movie of humanity and machinery. I totally buy that. It's a very infectious score too, where it gets you excited about the violence in a way that makes you check yourself a little bit. Someone gets brutally murdered and the music makes you rooting for it in a weird way. Why did I cheer on that person to get ripped apart by bullets? That is the back and forth at all 80s action cinema, isn't it? When the bad guy tortures somebody, it's evil. But when Rambo or Arnold Schwarzenegger blows somebody up, it's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's partly why it's easy to hook onto this movie as a child. Even though it is ultra-violent, it does this thing where it's kind of like this Death Wish style conservative nightmare. These very clear bad guys, and they're so bad, and they need to be destroyed by the good, which is the law. And this movie is obviously taking a more satirical approach to that, where it's making fun of movies like Death Wish. Death Wish has no level of self-awareness at all. Yeah, and this movie is deliberately playing with that very juvenile idea of bad guys and good guys. But that's not necessarily something you latch on onto when you're a kid. The satirical elements go over your head and you just know that Robocop looks awesome and it's totally badass when he blows up a bad guy. Yeah, and they are bad. <laughs> they are objectively evil people. The version of Detroit in this movie is some kind of grand scale hell. I could ramble on it because I do love the original Robocop. For me, it's like a perfect movie. Someone asked me recently to list my favorite sci-fi movies. Making a quick list in 10 minutes, this film was in my top five. I really do think it stands as one of the great science fiction films of all time. It does a good job of mixing that 
that hard line sci-fi of cyborg technology. You get that great first person point of view of him going from surgery to rebirth. And then at the same time, the movie uses cinematic fantasy that's coming from the complete opposite direction. I think it's such a great marriage of those two opposing sides of the genre. The cyborg elements are probably plausible as far as real life science goes. Maybe not to the extent we see in this film, but to a degree. But then there's completely ridiculous stuff like the melting man or um, some of the satire like I'd buy that for a dollar. So farcical. <laughs> the roaring lion in the Ed 209 is just beyond <laughs> anything that someone would program a machine to do. It's so ridiculous. Probably not. I say I'd buy that for a dollar. So far it's cool and ridiculous. But then I still see people walking around with Bazinga written on t-shirts. So I don't know. <laughs> About a year ago, we gave this city Robocop. Ready for duty, partner? Nothing I'd rather do. I think he's worked out pretty well, but things have become a little rougher out there. You see, Robocop's off warranty. He's one of mine. And now, we need a law enforcement unit capable of meeting the enemy on his own ground. I'm carrying in a firepower to get the job done. With great pleasure, I give you Robocop 2. Kane, let's step outside. This was a pretty huge hit for Orion, who was a studio whose finances were always floundering. They really had this idea that, okay, Robocop is our franchise, so we gotta get some sequels out. They really wanted Verhoeven to come back, but he turned the project down because he said that Orion just wanted a quickie cash-in sequel. Ed Neumeyer and Mike Miner wrote a script. You can find it on the internet. It's subtitled Corporate Warfare, and apparently the setup is something like Robocop wakes up 30 years in the future. But then a writer's strike happened, so they couldn't use that script. Instead, what we got was Robocop 2, directed by Irving Kirshner and written by Frank Miller, who at the time was a very big name because of The Dark Knight Returns and all these comic books. And of course, now he's completely insane. But at the time, he was a hot talent. It feels like it's co-written by him and Studio Notes. From what I've read, there was a lot of changing with the script and that pissed all the actors off. And you can tell, I'm not a huge fan of RoboCop 2. You've already said you do like this movie. My regular co-host loves it. It's his favorite RoboCop film. But the story for this is both incredibly convoluted and also really simple. It's both overwritten and under I can kind of see Batman Returns complaint with this movie where maybe there's not enough Robocop in the film and it focuses on two entirely different sets of villains. It does have flashes of pure brilliance. Kind of like what you were saying with the first movie how it's a parody of 80s action movies and a participant at the same time. I think the sequel is very interesting in that it's making fun of sequels. OCP is both developing a literal Robocop 2 repeat the success of the first cyborg they made and all the prototypes keep killing themselves, which is a funny version of what you were just saying about all the different scripts of this dying. And there's another sequence where they're reprogramming the original RoboCop. Basically have these focus group of all these concerned parents saying, RoboCop is too violent, we want it to do this. Yeah, he needs to be more kid-friendly. Trying to make it a more marketable object, they ruin everything that's good about him and completely ruin his functionality, which I think is kind of a funny joke about the idea of the sequel having so many studio hands in it. It's almost as if the sequel subtext is arguing against its own existence. Yeah, I think it can be funny in that way. It's self-aware. In a way, it really shouldn't be, considering how much money and attention was paid to it. Yeah, and I do like that sequence where classically has three or four prime directives, and then they pump hundreds of them into his brain to the point where everything is conflicting with each other. That scene is very funny because he's doing things like reading Miranda rights to a corpse. (laughs) The famous one is he shoots the cigarette out of the guy's mouth and says that this is a no-smoking zone. (laughs) And like little children are making fun of him. Go fuck a refrigerator, peckerneck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a um, very goofy uh, sequence. And that stuff is great. There's just a moment where Robocop is going on about the beauty of the day. Peter Weller does a thing with his hands as if he's taking in the world. That is a really funny moment. Unfortunately, that stuff doesn't really have a lot to do with the rest of the story. There's two plots. There's the OCP plot, and then there's the, the drug cult using future drugs to control the poor. And those two things are oddly separate. You would think they would converge more than they do. Yeah, they really don't even begin to come together until the final third act. And also, that drug subplot bugs me. It feels like something from the Just Say No era. It's definitely like an anti-drug message. Little kids are getting hooked on the most addictive narcotic in history. Right, Um, it's high is like a religious awe. They sell it pretty well. The guy Tom Noonan that plays the cult leader Kane is very effective in this. He scared the shit out of me as a kid in Last Action Hero. I still get chills when I look at him. He's scary in that, and he's scary in Manhunter. Noonan does crazy well. Oh, yeah. The movie gets carried on personalities like that. His little kid that he indoctrinates is 
is interesting. Yeah, it, it's a little corny. It starts to give you hints of what will come in the movie that came after this, but mm-hmm. I think it's still enough original RoboCop to work. So you like the ultra-violent child character. I think it's hilarious. I think it's even more hilarious that it pissed off Ebert so much that he thought this movie was morally reprehensible. Ebert had this weird thing. Anytime you made children violent, it really, really upset him. I know he gave the movie Kick-Ass zero stars because the character of Hit Girl just upset him so much. I see it, and I see what he's saying. Earlier we were talking about how every time a bullet hits somebody in the first RoboCop movie, there's just so much blood. Mm-hmm. And as these sequels get more slick and more commercial, the effect of that violence isn't felt as much. And I think what he was trying to say was, if you're gonna get ultra-violent, it shouldn't be fun. But it works so well in that first one, though, you know? Yeah, it does. I find that push and pull kind of interesting. A lot of people have this complaint about Part 2. The violence in this one comes off as a little mean-spirited somehow. I'm not sure how... <laughs> it's not like it's any different from what was done in the first one. Something about the tone. The rest of the movie's goofy, but the violence is still very hard-hitting. The satire in the first movie smoothed that over, but in this one they jive, in my opinion. There is one two-punch that goes really far. It's a two-torture scene sequence where Robocop is dismantled slowly, and that is hard to watch. There's no relief after that. They go immediately into a second torture scene where the drug cult tortures a cop and cuts open his sternum and the child is forced to watch. Uh, Right. This got really bleak for a movie that started off really fun. And there's still humor in there, even after that moment. For somebody who's like a hardcore fan of that first one, there are little character inconsistencies that bug me. This movie really fucks up Alex Murphy's character arc. It's a completely different version of Robocop to me. He does like deeper voice. It's more cartoonish. It's almost like he's playing the character in a completely different tone to match the script. But it is definitely different from what he originally established. Bugs me a little bit. The first movie was all about Murphy regaining his humanity and it ended with him succeeding in that. In part two, instead of going off of that in an interesting way, what happens now? Now that he's a machine who's realized he's a man, he's going to try and reestablish a relationship with his wife. They hit at that. There's that one scene where Murphy meets his his ex-wife. He tells her to go away and then that never comes up again throughout the rest of the film. I think he's trying to set himself free from a lot of things. Get rid of the guilt of causing this woman grief. It is weird to have that stalking thing where he's following his grieving wife around and reminding her her husband's body is being used for this new experiment. It's weird to have the resolution of that so early in the film and then not get addressed again. If that had come in the third act, it would have been a little more deliberate feeling instead of just a weird afterthought. And it's moments like that where you can tell this was a writer's strike movie. Yeah, there's studio notes all over this film, but I do have an affinity for these kinds of properties where it's so blatantly commercial, but something beautifully bizarre comes out of it. You can feel it in the first sequence. There's this really expensive chain of events where a thief mugs an old lady and then he gets beaten up by these sex workers outside a porn theater and then the gun store next door gets exploded by a rocket launcher. You could just feel all this big studio money coming in and heightening the production value, but the things that are actually being depicted are still super bizarre and weird. Not something that you would typically see on a commercial film. Really like that dynamic of something that's obviously supposed to sell a lot of tickets, that's still gross and ugly and cartoonish in a way that you wouldn't normally see in a studio picture. Now I understand what you mean when you compare it to Batman Returns, which is the super weird, grotesque, German expressionistic horror homage that was made to sell Happy Meal toys. Yeah, it's so weird. I really love that dynamic. One of the weirder elements of this movie, and plot-wise it makes absolutely no sense, but as an idea, it's sort of ridiculous and appealing. In the last act where Kane is turned into a giant, crack-addicted killer robot. (laughs) The best part of that is the scientist who is teasing him with the giant doses of drugs to bribe him into doing her will. He extends this claw out of his chest to go grab it. His heart is literally reaching for drugs. Claw's kind of like quivering with the anticipation of grabbing the nuke. There's a little moment. I talked about Phil Tippett's stop-motion effects in the first one, and he came back and did the effects for this one, too. At the end there, where they're presenting Robocop 2 Kane to the crowd, first off, it makes no sense because he has live ammunition on him. The old man holds up this giant tube of drugs to say, this is the plague we're trying to get rid of. And then in the background, you can see Kane's claws snap nervously, like, <laughs> what? Give me, give me the drugs. I think the movie immediately falls apart right after that. That last act is a mess. Things are happening for no reason. It is really impressively smooth stop motion animation. The final battle between Robocop and Robocop 2. It looks almost CGI-ish. You get that superhero movie fatigue during that battle. It does go on a little long. Yeah, it's just massive carnage. It's there for its own sake. You mentioned the stop motion is awesome, but I just wish it was in a better movie. Maybe if this were 20 minutes shorter with maybe five less screenwriters, it could have been something really 
really interesting. I do like when it's making fun of that it is a commercial sequel. It just doesn't develop on the first one in a very interesting way. And yeah, there's cool special effects and there's funny elements and there's some really cool action scenes. And that moment where Robocop's on the motorcycle and he's playing chicken with the truck, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it doesn't have the spirit or the heart of the first one. And when it does, it's kind of echoing things that were already accomplished. Like when they do the commercial spoofs in here. Oh yeah, funny. they're not as good. They're funny, but yeah, they're an empty echo of something that was done better before it. I want to mention one thing about Leonard Rosamond's music in this is he actually has a choir chanting Robocop. That was probably a step too far. <laughs> If you're going to go over the top and overdo everything and overstate yourself, there's no reason to hold back when it comes to chanting Robocop on the soundtrack. He was state-of-the-art in law enforcement technology. You called for backup. But the system thinks he's become too independent. He disobeyed a direct order. I want to know why. Too unpredictable, too human. We have a warrant out for the arrest of Robocop. Now, the system's out to get him. Because he's fighting for the people. You are under arrest for assaulting an officer. He's taking the future and giving it back to the people. Say what you will about RoboCop 2, it's a super flawed film, but it's definitely better than the next one. Yeah, I watched RoboCop 3 for the first time for this podcast, and oh boy. Uh, my decision to delay it as long as possible was a smart one. This <laughs> dire. On paper, it may have been a sound decision. Fred Decker directing this, who made Night of the Creeps and Monster Squad, two movies I love. Oh yeah, me too. That guy doing a RoboCop movie sounds like a cool idea. And even though his script was ruined for the second one, they somehow got Frank Miller back to write the screenplay again, and then the exact same thing happened. His script was butchered and completely rewritten. What ended up happening is Orion went bankrupt while this movie was in post-production. It was filmed in 1991 and wouldn't come out until 1993. And by that point, nobody gave a shit about RoboCop, so it was a huge flop. Except in Japan. It was a hit in Japan for some reason. (laughs) The same way that I find the commercialism interesting in the second one, you can feel them trying to milk every penny out of the third one in a way that seems more desperate. One of the first shots in the film, if I'm not mistaken, is of a RoboCop toy at a child's bedside. Yeah, yeah, that is early on. And I think it says a lot that in the first one, Robocop's mechanical arch enemy is this giant panzer tank machine. And in the second one, it's the super elaborate stop motion robot. And then in the third one, it's a Japanese guy with a sword. Who is technically a complicated robot. Yeah, but it's a much cheaper special effect. (laughs) Yeah, totally. The idea of introducing kung fu robots should be very exciting, but somehow it's just super boring. And it's such a Frank Miller thing, too. It's like right out of his comic Ronin basic plot is the Japanese are threatening to buy out OCP so they need to get Delta City made immediately and RoboCop ends up in between the corporation and the people. That early 90s idea that Japan was going to buy out everything. Yeah, I like the one note in the Japanese corporate takeover where OCP is flipping out and you see all these business execs leaping out of windows. It right, does kind of like, feel like the end of the Reagan era boom. It's so funny to look back at movies like this and Rising Sun and then even one of the Godzilla movies has a subplot about Japan buying American businesses. And of course it didn't happen. Japan didn't take over the world. Their financial bubble popped the next year. So it immediately becomes a relic of the time. And that amuses me, going back and seeing something so indicative of 1991 in this. It's hard to be amused by much besides that. I like seeing baby-faced character actors in here. Yeah, like Stephen Root, CCH Pounder, and Mako shows up. Bradley Whitford looks like a baby in this. I've never seen him so young. Jill Hennessy has a supporting part, and she would later star in a top show called Crossing Jordan that I used to watch with my mom. I guess we gotta say, this is a PG-13 RoboCop movie. There's no ultra-violence in this film. I'm surprised it got slapped with a 13. It could have easily just been a PG film with a couple of cuts. Yeah, there's one or two squibs. That's it. This is a bloodless RoboCop. The satire is real way back. There's one joke commercial. The movie ups the kid-friendly goofiness. The Mohawk gang members that look like they're out of a Capcom arcade game. <laughs> or that scene where RoboCop drives the pimp mobile. Yeah, that's pretty lame. They also give him a bunch of lame sub Schwarzenegger one-liners. Yeah, I don't uh, even remember those, but okay. <laughs> well, there's two. There's one where some OCP guy asks his co-worker if he has a light, and then RoboCop's like, allow me, scum, and then lights the whole room on fire with a flamethrower. Oh, yeah, yeah. And All then there's another bad. one where two OCP officers are hassling a teen sex worker in front of a brothel. She's screaming, and RoboCop walks up, and he says, she said no. 
maybe you have a hearing problem. Bad (laughs) one-liners. Yeah, it's very misunderstanding of what made this series different. Then they give him a kid sidekick. The kid genius who can uh, an Ed 209 with a Palm Pilot. The joke about her making the Ed 209 as foil as a puppy, that feels like it's for a young age bracket. They were aiming for the kiddie aisles in this one for sure. Which is really weird. How do you go from the super violent, gritty action movie to something for kids? But that was the time. We'll talk about it more later, but there was the string of Saturday morning cartoon shows based off of R-rated movies in the 80s and 90s, and RoboCop was one of them. I don't understand where that has gone. Whatever era this movie came out in in the early 90s, where they sanitized everything to reach the largest audience possible, I'm not sure we've quite recovered from that. Late 80s, mid 80s stuff like Terminator and movies like that, they are super violent, but children did latch onto them because of, I guess, the personality and the design quirks. I would say there is exactly two good scenes in RoboCop 3. That's very generous. <laughs> the first one, the scene where he has a church full of homeless people behind him, and then they call him rehabs. They're the OCP army who's getting the people out of the slums. And his two prime directives are conflicting with each other. You uphold the law and protect the innocent. That fizzles out in a super boring way, but that's a really interesting concept. And then after Anne is killed, you mentioned it earlier, knowing Fred Decker came from directing horror films to this, that scene where he's carrying Anne Lewis's dead body through the church kind of looks like something out of a gothic horror film. Yeah, I really like the reverence of that shot. It feels very heightened in a way the rest of the movie doesn't. It's such a flat, joyless movie. To have this one moment that has a religious air to it is very jarring. And notably, Nancy Allen only agreed to appear in this film if they killed her character off. (laughs) So she wanted off the franchise train. Peter Weller is not in this one. He was filming Naked Lunch at the time, and I've always wondered if his extreme discomfort in the suit in the first two movies had something to do with his decision not to come back for this one. (laughs) So instead, they got a guy named Robert John Burke. He's done a couple of things. The movie's Dust Devil, and it was directed Uh, by... Richard Stanley? Richard Stanley, thank you. Yeah, he did that, and then he did the movie. So Mm. for some reason, Robert John Burke was the go-to guy if you needed a leading man to act under a lot of prosthesis. I really know him as the evil dad from Gossip Girl, which I've seen people watch in the background a lot. Oh, Um, yeah, I've never seen that show. (laughs) He's okay. He's very much replicating what Weller was doing in the first two movies, but he just doesn't have the same pathos. And also, the voice is different, and that messes with me in a weird way. The only way I can see why they cast him is when he has the helmet off and you just see him in the regular makeup. He does look strikingly like Peter Weller. Give you an idea of how quickly this movie was made. They didn't even make a new suit for the new actor. They actually put him in the same costume Peter Weller wore. Robert John Burke was a little taller than Peter Weller, so being in the suit was physically painful for him. Oh, God. There are some conceptually interesting ideas in this movie, like the robot samurai. There's a cool shot where he gets hit in the face with a steel bar and he straightens his jaw. But then there's stuff that was never a good idea, like giving RoboCop a jetpack. Yeah, him flying like Superman at the end is very exhausting. Not at all cohesive with the series. The start earlier on when he's on fire and walking through a drug den or something, that felt a little more RoboCop spirited to me. By the end, it feels like a Richard Donner movie. Special effects spectacle and nothing to do with the character. I would not compare it to Richard Donner. (laughs) It's much, much worse than a Richard Donner movie. Interestingly, you would think Fred Decker, this director coming out of Independence, going and making a big studio movie, and it's super shitty. Obviously, he got steamrolled by the production company, but he actually takes full responsibility for RoboCop 3. Maybe that's why Fred Decker hasn't made another movie. Yeah, I wonder if there's a RoboCop curse. That was his last movie, and I think Kirshner's last film was the second one. I don't know. Ooh, yeah. Well, Verhoeven did okay, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we are on the eve of a technological revolution. We're gonna put a man inside a machine. He suffered fourth-degree burns over 80% of his body. What the hell did you do to me? Make him more tactical. Let's go with black. When the machine fights, the system releases signals into Alex's reign, making him think he's in control. But he's not. I've selected 13 targets, all wanted for murder. This is the future of American justice. Better alive. You're coming with me. RoboCop 3 was kind of the end of the franchise. We'll get to some other stuff here in a minute. As far as theatrically released films go, that was basically the end. We get into the new century. The mid-2000s was that period in time where a studio said, hey, if we've got an IP with even the tiniest bit of name recognition, we have to bring it back. And there was no way that a movie like RoboCop wasn't going to get remade. It feels like they're especially hell-bent on remaking Verhoeven's movies as these PG-13 properties. Because there was that super shitty Total Recall remake 
remake, and they've been talking about rebooting Starship Troopers as well. I feel like we're just a couple of years short of them doing a nudity-free version of Showgirls. Like, it feels like they're slowly ramping up to that. <laughs> well, there is the uh, edited for cable version where they put digital bikinis <laughs> on all the dancers. That's the version they'll remake in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> The RoboCop remake was almost directed by Darren Aronofsky. He was oh, briefly wow. attached in 2008. For a while there, it seemed like Darren Aronofsky was getting attached to these studio superhero movies. He was going to direct Watchmen. He was going to direct the second Wolverine movie. He always dropped out because his style is not cohesive with the studio process, I guess. And eventually, the RoboCop remake was made by a Brazilian filmmaker. I'm probably saying this incorrectly. Jose Padilla? No idea. I didn't even look it up. The thing with a property like RoboCop, in 2014 when the remake came out, it's not a property that the general public loves a lot. It's just the hardcore fans that are super attached to this. The studio thinks this property has a lot of name recognition, but it's really only a small group that cares about it. And they're going to hate it. going to hate the idea of a remake on principle. I think it has a Devo problem where people remember it as a novelty and not something that was very subversive. Yeah, and it didn't help that there were all these spinoffs that came that were watered down versions. Yeah, and if you remember Robocop from like, the cartoon show or something, it's not going to seem like something that was cultural really significant. What was overall your thoughts on this remake? First half hour of the film is very inspired. It's one of those reimaginings where they could probably change the title and like a couple plot details and not even have to pay for the property. Um, it goes into these new avenues of satire about privatized military, drone warfare, security state. Sam Jackson comes in as like a news anchor. Yeah, and he's very much a Bill O'Reilly like character. Yeah, and he totally gets the satire. He's playing it up for humor in a way that gets the spirit of the original, but but still brings new ideas to the table to kind of make it worthwhile. Oddly, when Murphy becomes RoboCop, the movie just crashes into this wall of PG-13 tedium. Everything after RoboCop is born is just so forgettable and bland. It's frustrating because it's one of those remakes that was almost good. And it has a totally different goal than the original. The director has talked about how his RoboCop is about a man losing his humanity and a human becoming a machine, which is completely different from the original, which was about a man regaining his humanity. This RoboCop, when he wakes up, he still has his personality. He's trying to maintain a relationship with his wife and kid, but his free will is being slowly stripped away by the corporate mandate of him being this super cop, so that OCP or, well, it's Omnicore in this one, but so they can sell their murder drones in America. Yeah, most of the CGI in the film takes away any of its personality, but that one scene where they show him what's left of his human body, where it's like a brain, a face, and lungs, it's not only like effective, chilling use of CGI, but it's interesting in watching them break down his personality. These are the parts that are left of you. We're going to make you into something new and different, but you kind of have to let go of thinking of yourself as a human being. And it's a pretty chilling moment. Yeah, Probably that is. The last good scene in the movie. So there are these interesting ideas in this remake, but as you said, it gets bogged down in a very uninspired action film. As soon as Murphy starts pursuing the person who killed him in his previous life, you just stop caring. It's really just a wash. I don't even think I took notes during the last hour of the film. Weirdly written, too, because it sets up this crime boss that killed Alex Murphy to be the main villain of the film, but then he dies off screen. Supposedly Murphy uncovers a police corruption scheme inside the police department, but that just doesn't go anywhere. They just drop that subplot altogether. It's frustrating. And then the last act when he's fighting the super boring Michael Bay Transformers Ed 209 is just a blur of CGI nonsense that has no weight or feeling to it at all. Yeah, and then you have Michael Keaton plays a Steve Jobs villain, but he doesn't leave any impact either. He just kind of floats in and out of the plot. It has a really good supporting cast. Samuel Jackson, Gary Oldman, I don't know how to say his name, but Jay Burchell, the dude from the Judd Apatow movies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jackie O'Hurley shows up. He's pretty good. The supporting cast is loaded, and then you have total bland piece of cardboard in the RoboCop suit. Joel Kinnaman, who is this dude that Hollywood just decided a few years ago is going to become a huge star, even though he's a complete void of charisma. Yeah, I've never seen this man before. And But apparently this Kinnaman guy was in Suicide Squad as well. He's done other things people have seen, whatever your opinion on that may be. When the posters came out, they showed the new RoboCop Cop is this guy in a black tactical battle suit. Obviously, fans are going to say, what the fuck is this shit? So interesting that this one was so boring, but that Dread 3D movie that came out around the same time did a much more interesting job of the same sleek suit and same kind of action. The RoboCop remake has some interesting ideas in it, but overall it's consumed by a bland, modern day action theatrics. As a screenwriter and a filmmaker myself, when a beloved property is rebooted or remade, sometimes I'll ask myself, how would I have done that? RoboCop is something that is so iconic 
iconic. I would not have attempted to remake that movie at all. That's why I like the boldness of them changing so much that really it's just Robocop in name only. It seemed like it was more interested in doing a completely different kind of film that when it actually had to be Robocop, it just didn't know what to do with itself. Yeah, they could have called it Robot the Cop. Right. (laughs) 55 scenes by 55 filmmakers. Dead or alive, you're coming with me. 10 Alex Murphys, 12 Clarence Bonnikers, 15 Lewises, and 30 Robocops. Featuring (laughs) everything you love about Robocop. Violence, (gasps) toys, evil corporations, dancing, and that beautiful silver suit. Our RoboCop Remake. Now, this is actually not the only RoboCop remake that was released in 2014. I don't know if you've heard about this. A group of people sent out tentacles to different filmmakers and said, we're going to do a shot-for-shot remake of the original RoboCop, and you're going to be able to do whatever you want with those scenes. Their mentality was, if somebody's going to ruin RoboCop, it should be us. And they released (laughs) this remake free to the internet. It's called Our RoboCop Remake. Have you seen this? I've only seen the spoof of the scene where the woman is almost raped. and he Okay, uh, the exploding dick sequence. Yeah. There's 20 dicks that explode, and it's a height of almost Tim and Eric levels of absurdity. But for some reason, I never actually sat down and watched the whole feature. I really need to get into that. I would recommend it, but anything that's made by 40 different filmmakers is going to be very uneven. There are sequences that are really funny and absurd and interesting, like the massacre of penises. That sequence is inspired. Murphy's death is recreated as an interpretive dance, (laughs) which is actually weirdly beautiful. There's one scene that's done with puppets. There's one scene that's done with babies. There's two separate musical sequences. And obviously it's this mixture of live action stuff and CGI and traditional animation. But there are definitely sequences that are not as funny. Some that just lean a little too hard on the potty humor. Or there's one really irritating moment that has 50 things happening on screen at the same time, all about explaining to the audience what deconstruction means. I thought that was a little too clever for its own good. But it um, seem like the kind of thing that might be exhausting at feature length. When you get like an isolated YouTube clip of it, it is very amusing. Overall, it was better than I was anticipating. I thought it would be like the ABC of death film or there's one or two good sequences and the rest of it's just terrible. Our RoboCop remake was actually relatively consistently amusing, so I would recommend that. Awesome. Yeah, I need to get into that. Detroit, the near future. Officer Alex J. Murphy and his partner Ann Lewis fight to rid the decaying city of the criminal element which infests it. After being mortally wounded in the line of duty, Officer Murphy is outfitted by OCP with bulletproof titanium robotic parts and with computer-enhanced motor and sensory capabilities. He has become the ultimate super cop. RoboCop. So before we wrap up, I just want to mention some of the weird multimedia RoboCop stuff. There have been four separate television versions of this franchise. There was RoboCop, the animated series that ran for 12 episodes in 1988. I watched a couple episodes of this and it struck me as very much a typical 80s kids cartoon. There was a live action television show called RoboCop, the series. This ran for one season in 1994. Richard Eden played RoboCop. And I watched one episode of this last night and I have to say it was one of the most painfully boring things I've ever seen in my life. I actually think I think this was my first exposure to RoboCop was an episode of that show. The episode I watched, RoboCop was framed for murder and he spent most of the episode hanging out in the sewers while the other cops that are presumably much cheaper to film did all the actual <laughs> crime fight. <laughs> the only thing that was weird or interesting about it was in RoboCop the series, his wife is dead and he can talk to her as a hologram, but she always appears in a nightgown. So RoboCop has a sexy dead wife hologram girlfriend for some reason. <laughs> It's the ultimate fridged woman. Yeah, it's super bizarre. Also, Joe Walsh and Lita Ford did the theme song. My God. There was a second cartoon, RoboCop Alpha Commando. This ran for 40 episodes from 1998 and 1999. I actually remember watching this as a kid. In this show, RoboCop is turned into Inspector Gadget. He has all these different gimmicks. He has rollerblades that come out of his feet, or he has nets that shoot out of his shoulders. It's not good. In 2001, there was a four-part miniseries called RoboCop Prime Directives. This was produced by the same people who did the live-action TV show, because there option was about to expire, so they decided to rush this out. It's four 90-minute episodes, so it's basically four movies. I watched the whole thing. I watched all six hours of it, and the people who made this, their hearts were in the right place. They were trying to bring it back to the original. The satirical elements are present, and it's way more violent than the previous live-action shows, but they had no money. It's super, super cheap. Like I said, it's a six-hours miniseries, and it had four hours of story, so stuff is dragged out. The premise is RoboCop's around, and then his best friend is killed and also turned into a RoboCop, so there's a good 
RoboCop and an evil RoboCop and they're fighting. For the hardcore fans, maybe give RoboCop Prime Directives a look, but it's mediocre for the most part. And then there have been a bunch of comics. Marvel published some comics, Dark Horse published some comics, Dynamite, Boom, all these studios have done different RoboCop things. And the only one of these I really want to mention is in 1992, Dark Horse published RoboCop versus Terminator. Oh, I would read that for sure. I haven't had a chance to read it. I did play the Super Nintendo video game that was made based on it, and it was pretty fun. And apparently they proposed the idea of RoboCop versus Predator, but it wasn't published. We know that Ole Anderson has threatened Sting, and Sting has now made it clear he will be a capital combat with RoboCop. Horseman, you said you were going to take me out. You said I'd never wrestle again. But you made a big mistake when you started messing with the little stingers. So now the time has come. Blair, if you think you're invincible. Take it over, Creed. Got listed here some other weird miscellaneous things. Did you know that RoboCop appeared in the 1987 Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? I did not know that. Did yeah, they make he, him walk or was he on a float? He's on the Marvel Comics float and it's actually super disappointing. He only shows up for two minutes to the point where you wonder why is RoboCop on the Marvel Comics float? I mean, they were publishing a comic at the time, but it seems super random through modernized. And then you wrote about this for your website. In 1990, RoboCop appeared in a WCW pay-per-view event. It's called Capital Combat, The Return of RoboCop. Now, let's talk about about him barely being in it, I think two minutes is about right. Right. I was going to say, from my understanding, the whole event was built around RoboCop, and he's only actually in two minutes. He's not in the ring doing body slams on anybody. He just shows up and lets Sting out of a cage, and that's his entire involvement. It's a weird time because Sting was for the children in the way that a lot of faces are in wrestling. So RoboCop is brought in as a hero to children everywhere. And really, the only thing that had come out before then, if I'm not mistaken, was just the first movie. It was already an ultra-violent franchise that children had sort of attached themselves to. Yeah, he just walks down a ramp and it looks very labored for him to walk that far and lifts a door off a cage and sets Sting free. But they spend the entire night, every match, being RoboCop's coming, RoboCop. Next segment, I think, RoboCop might be here. So when he finally comes out from 90 seconds of content, it's such a wasted amount of energy. It's really funny. I've never been into pro wrestling, but all my friends are picked up a little bit. And it seems to me in late 80s, early 90s, when WCW and WWF were really aiming for the kids. There was a lot of stuff like this. Pro wrestling is pretty much a carny act. You have to self-promote. You always have to push the next big thing that's down the line. Nothing's ever resolved. During this time, there was a ratings war between the two factions that got very ridiculous uh, in the late 90s. WCW was new to the market, and their whole thing was this gimmicky bullshit. The idea of promoting RoboCop and then him only being there for 90 seconds is so in line with WCW's whole ethos. Promise the world and deliver as little as possible. Was it WCW or WWF that had the wrestler that was dressed like a turkey. Oh man, I can't even tell you. I I wish I knew that one. I do know that WCW did give David Arquette, the actor, the championship belt to promote Ready to Rumble. And he's a wrestling fan in real life. But he was like, this is a mistake. People are going to hate this. (laughs) Weird. I used to look down on pro wrestling like, oh, this is super stupid and goofy. But at some point I had an awakening and realized, well, this is really no different from comic books or any of the stupid bullshit I'm into. So I have no right to look down on wrestling. It's one of my favorite forms of art, but it is definitely stupid and goofy at the same time. Let the ham fry the chicken. Oh, let the ham fry the chicken. 발라 먹으니까 질감 나게 맛있습니다. 손날 깨다 주세요. 뼈 없는 닭 튀김. Let the ham fry the chicken. Let the ham ding dong shikpo. Two other things I just want to mention, these are basically internet memes, is the South Korean RoboCop fried chicken commercial. That is the most brilliant two minutes of RoboCop content. <laughs> it, it's yeah, so you're, bizarre. Yeah, he emerges from the television and steals the family's refrigerator, I believe. I really can't track the plot of that commercial. People are just very excited that he's there, though. That has been circulating since the early days of the internet. That's been going around in 144 pixel downloads for years. <laughs> I'm sure you've probably seen the picture of when RoboCop met Richard Nixon. I don't know if I've seen that or not, honestly. Well, look it up because it's delightful. Is a picture of Richard Nixon shaking hands with a guy in a very, very cheap-looking RoboCop costume. <laughs> this is from 1987, and apparently there was some sort of tie-in with the Boys Clubs of America, and Orion was doing a sweepstakes for the VHS release of the first movie. For some reason, Richard Nixon was there, so they got a photo op of Richard Nixon shaking hands with RoboCop, and that's one of those delightful images throughout history that are completely free of context. Much like his Elvis picture. Very similar. What was with Richard Nixon taking 
taking pictures, shaking hands with these pop culture icons. Why would they think that Nixon's cultural cachet in the 80s would be good for their property? It's yeah. way past anyone thinking that he's a good or viable product. Right. Why would they think that the kids who are going to rent RoboCop would give a shit about Richard Nixon? <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. This is RoboCop. Drug lords are launching weapons of terror. We must fight back. Your telephone is linked to my weapon system. Call now to activate. Dial 1-900-820-8888. Terminate the evil forces and you could win the RoboCop Game Boy. Our grand prize winner receives the official RoboCop pinball machine. Crush these creeps. Thank you so much for being on the show, Brandon. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I always like reading your stuff. And well, um, the you. last time I contributed was for your end of the year roundup, which was like a good 20 second clip. So it was a lot more fun to actually get into something a little deeper. Please tell the audience what your website is. Swampflix.com. That is the Netflix of the swamp. We are uh, a small collective in New Orleans that basically we just write one post a day. We also have a podcast that you can find on any podcatcher. Is that what they call those? It's just called the Swampflix podcast. <laughs> Definitely check that out. I recommend his website i read it often it's very amusing once again thanks so much for coming on the show and yapping about robocop for 90 minutes with me oh yeah it was a lot of fun you can find the bangers and mash show on facebook at www.facebook.com slash the bangers and mash show i know the show's been super inactive here late and i'm hoping to make up for that in the next couple of weeks there's going to be some more episodes like this with some guest hosts and hopefully i can get jd back on the show in the near future thanks so much for listening and until next time stay out of trouble